she's probably in her church tonight, but uh, she was a little under the weather a week or two ago, and so uh, she decided that she was going to listen to Daddy preach. And uh, so uh, I, I'm scolding her. But amen. Let's uh, take our Bibles. Turn with 2 Samuel chapter number 17. Now, I know I've given the subtitle here, Separate Situations and One Outcome. I am going to address that right at the very end of the message. But this evening, there's a lot of groundwork that needs to be covered. And one of the things that um, I wanted to do as we were going through this part of David's life, is I wanted to turn over some stones that a lot of times we just kind of read over. And there are some facts that we can find right here in the Bible that are right there for us. All we have to do is is look for them uh, and see them and and, uh, see the significance in that. And we're going to be doing a little bit of that this evening. Uh, But... Uh, I'm going to ask you to stand if you're able to. Uh, when you found 2 Samuel chapter 17, I want to begin reading in verse number 14. And verse 14 says, And Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The counsel of Hushai the archite is better than the counsel of Ahithophel. For the Lord had appointed to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring evil upon Absalom. Then said Hushai unto Zadok and to Abiathar the priest, Thus and thus did Ahithophel counsel Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus and thus have I counseled. Now therefore send quickly and tell David, saying, Lodge not this night in the plains of the wilderness, but speedily pass over, lest the king be swallowed up and all the people that are with him. Now Jonathan and Ahimaaz stayed in Enronhel, for they might not be seen to come into the city. And a wench went and told them, and They went and told King David. Nevertheless, a lad saw them and told Absalom, but they went both of them away quickly and came to a man's house in Baharim, which had a well in his court, whether they went down. And the woman took uh, took and spread a covering over the well's mouth and spread ground corn thereon, And the thing was not known. And when Absalom's servants came to the woman to the house, they said, Where is Ahimaaz and Jonathan? And the woman said unto them, They be gone over the brook of water. And and, and when they had sought and could not find them, they returned to Jerusalem. And it came to pass after they departed, that they came up out of the well and went and told King David and said unto David, Arise and pass quickly Over the water, for thus hath Ahithophel counseled against you. Uh, Let's stop there and pray. Father, we do love you. Thank you for the good day today. Lord, would you bless now our evening. Help us to uh, grasp the facts. Help us to learn a lesson tonight. And we'll just be careful to thank you and praise you, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now there's a lot that is going on here in this situation. And last week, we spent the majority of our time looking at Absalom's original counselor, Ahithophel. You'll remember Ahithophel had joined himself to Absalom uh, immediately uh, when Absalom blew the trumpets and Uh, pronounced himself king and started marching, uh, well, even before he marched into Jerusalem, Ahithophel had joined himself to Absalom. And Ahithophel's a smart guy. And the Word of God tells us that. And even in the text that we're reading uh, this evening, 
uh, we, it is described that Ahithophel's counsel was good counsel, uh, but God intervened to overthrow that good counsel and to destroy Absalom uh, by that. But he was considered a wise man, both by David and by Absalom. But last week we looked at his agenda. He had a personal agenda that clouded his judgment and really just wanted to, to, to get David. And, uh, you know, I understand uh, uh, some of these things as a grandfather and all of that. And uh, I'm not going to go into all of that again this evening. But uh, he had a definite agenda. And it was Ahithophel that instructed Absalom to set a tent on the top of the palace and lie with David's ten concubines. And we looked at that last week. And after Absalom followed that advice, Ahithophel decided he was going to offer more advice. And uh, in that advice came by way of what to do next about David. In chapter 17, the first four verses, uh, Ahithophel uh, advises uh, Absalom, let me lead an army. Let me choose 12,000 men. And we're going to go out immediately into the wilderness. We're going to find David uh, and we are going to uh, kill him because he is weary and he is weak right now. And, and uh, when I defeat him, all the people that are with David, they're going to come back to Jerusalem and they're going to embrace you as king. And uh, of course, all of that sat real well with Absalom. Because Absalom's liking this. Hey, they're going to recognize me as king. And uh, yes, uh, that sounds good. But something inside him uh, drove him to seek a second opinion. And thus he called Hushai the Archite. Hushai the Archite was David's friend. And he had... Uh, originally gone out with David out in the wilderness and wanted to go with David, but David sent him back with a special mission. Uh, I want you, Hushai, uh, to be my eyes and my ears in the palace, and, and I want you to uh, overthrow the council of Ahithophel. Uh, and that was a dangerous thing for Hushai to do, but nevertheless, he did. And Absalom, he looks at Hushai, and he said, wait a minute, aren't you David's friend? And we looked last week how that Hushai said, well, wait a minute, uh, my primary job is to be a counselor to the king of Israel. And you're sitting on the throne now, and that's what we're going to do. And of course, that kind of played in on the pride of Absalom. And Hushai is also considered a wise man. So when Ahithophel gives the advice, let me lead an army, and give me 12,000 men, and I'll go kill him. When Hushai is asked, Hushai says, that's not good advice for this time. And he began to uh, give his advice. He tells uh, Absalom that, David, your father is a warrior, and you know that. And the men that are with him are mighty men of valor, and they're experienced, and these are men that have toppled large armies. And not only that, right now they're pretty angry. As a mama bear uh, deprived of her wealth, they are angry. And so uh, I've got a different plan. And uh, his plan was, Absalom, take the time to gather a larger army. And instead of Ahithophel leading the army, you say you're king, you lead the army. You do it yourself. And he begins to play 
once again on the pride of Absalom. You know, if you're going to be king, you better first prove yourself to be king. And if you lead this army, and when you defeat David, your father, everybody considers David to be that mighty warrior. Well, you're going to be the one leading the army that defeats him. And so history is going to be remembered that even though your dad was a great warrior, you're the one that defeated him, and you're going to be considered mightier than your dad. Oh, man. When Absalom hears that, his pride got him whipped up in a frenzy here and decides to follow that plan. Uh, verse 14, And Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The counsel of Hushai the archite is better than the counsel of Ahithophel, for the Lord had appointed defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring evil upon Absalom. But remember where Hushai's loyalty lies. He's David's friend. And Hushai knows that if David can get across the Jordan, he can supply his army, and he can just be able to have a, a, a few days to sit, meditate, pray, seek guidance from God what to do. And so he's buying David a little bit of time. Now, there's a lot of things that are going to come into play this evening. And I want to begin by highlighting uh, the courageous confidants of David. Let's look at verses 15, 16, and 17 again. Then said Hushai unto Zadok and Abiathar the priests, Thus and thus did Ahithophel counsel Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus and thus have I counseled. Now therefore send quickly and tell David, saying, Lodge not this night in the plains of the wilderness, but speedily pass over, lest the king be swallowed up and all the people that are with him. Now Jonathan in Ahimaaz uh, stayed in, in Rongel that they might not be seen to come into the city. And a wench went out and told them, and they went and told King David. Now the plan had always been that Hushai, he would relay the intel to David through the priest. He would enter into the temple and relay Absalom's plan to the two priests, Zadok and Abiathar, and they would send their sons, Jonathan and Amahiah, uh, as messengers to David. That was, that was the plan that was set up from the beginning, and that's exactly what happens here. Uh, these two sons of the priests, they are going to act as go-betweens, and by doing that, they're putting their lives in danger. And uh, you'll notice in verse number 16 uh, that the plan is implemented uh, immediately. And uh, the message they send to David in verse number 16 is, Don't stay this night in the plains of the wilderness, uh, but pass over the Jordan River immediately. Uh, but the message almost didn't get to David. Because it's a dangerous job. And people in Absalom's camp are looking to make sure that there's no message going to get to David. And so uh, the two sons of the priest, uh, they stayed at a place called Enrangel so that they would not be observed entering or leaving through the gates of Jerusalem. So they're in a separate place. They're just waiting for a message to leave so that they can then relay it to David. Now, Enronjel uh, is an interesting place. 
Uh, it is less than a mile from the south wall of Jerusalem. And it's the location of a very important spring. And these two sons of the priest, they stayed at that location waiting for a message uh, to come so that they can relay it. And uh, of course, Zadok and Abiath are sent a wench to them with this important message. Uh, David, do not stay in the wilderness. Get over that river right away. Uh, and so as the wench leaves the gates of the city, uh, that wench tells them, but there's a lad there at the spring that recognizes what's going on. And sends word back to Absalom, hey, wait a minute, uh, there seems to be these two sons of the priest, Jonathan and um, uh, Amahaz, uh, they are going to be the conduit of these messages, and uh, you need to uh, take care of, of this. And so uh, they, they are discovered uh, by this lad in verse number 18. Nevertheless, a lad saw them and told Absalom, but they went both of them away quickly and came to a man's house in Bahurim, which, is, which had a well in his court, whither they went down. So uh, you'll notice that immediately uh, Jonathan and Ahimaaz uh, leave uh, as soon as they're discovered, uh, and they go to a place go, called Baharim, uh, which incidentally is the same place that Shimei cursed David and threw stones at him as David was leaving Jerusalem in the previous chapter. It's located just east of Jerusalem, just past the Mount of Olives. And it is here that they are hidden in a well. And when Absalom's servants uh, came searching, they are told that they had already been fled. And uh, once Absalom's servants are gone, Jonathan and Ahima, uh, Ahimaaz uh, went to David, gave him the message, and David and his men crossed the Jordan that night, verses 18 through 22. But um, there is an urgency in this message. And the urgency is there because Absalom would not be far behind. Now, let's pick it up in verse 24. Verse 24, Then David came to Mahanim, and Absalom passed over Jordan, he and all the men of Israel with him. And Absalom made Amasa captain of the host instead of Joab, which Amasa was a man's son whose name was uh, Ithra, an Israelite, that went into Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, sister to Zariah, Joab's mother. So Israel and Absalom pitched in the land of Gilead. And it came to pass when David was come to Mahamin, uh, that Shobai, the son of Nahash of Reba of the children of Ammon, and Mashir, the son of Amiel of Lodibar, and Barzilla, the Gileadite of Rosalim, brought beds and basins and earthen vessels and wheat and barley and flour and parched corn and uh, beans and lentils and parched pulse and honey and butter and sheep and cheese of kind for David and for the people that were with him to eat. For they said, the, the people is hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. Uh, so I, I wanted to read all of that because I wanted to see that Absalom's not far behind uh, David and not far behind these messengers. And um, uh, Mahanim is another significant place maybe that you can do your own study on, but it's the place that Ishbosheth, Saul's son, ruled Israel from while David was still in Hebron. And uh, uh, where, depending on where David crossed the Jordan River from, uh, it's about 20 to 40 miles away from the Jordan River. So uh, David 
got a pretty good start because of the coverage uh, of these confidants, these spies, these, uh, these sons of the priests. Uh, because of their courageous actions, David's able to uh, get 20 to 40 miles uh, inland here uh, by the time that Absalom and his army cross uh, over there. So uh, we see the cor- courageous actions of these two. Uh, But I want to look next at Absalom's actions in verse 24 and verse 25. In verse 24, uh, Absalom has got his army. He has passed over Jordan. uh, And there in verse number 25, he makes a change here uh, in his organization. Uh, We see that he makes a mesa captain of the host instead of Joab. Now, we know where Joab's at. Joab's with David. So, he's got to have a new captain of the army. And he has made Amasa uh, the captain of the host instead of Joab. And it's said that Amasa was a man's son whose name was Ithra, an Israelite, that went into Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, sister to Zariah, Joab's mother. So uh, he's gathered his host. Uh, He has uh, set the new captain of his host in place. But this is where it gets kind of interesting here. Uh, They are all related. All of them are related. It's funny. Joab and Abishai were the sons of David's sister, Zariah. And Amasa, who is now captain of the host for Absalom, he was the son of David's other sister, Abigail. This made all three of them David's nephews. And Joab and Abishai and Amasa, they're all cousins. So, I, I mean, this is a family affair for sure. And uh, to, uh, to make it interesting, uh, to follow all the genealogy of this, you can go to 1 Chronicles chapter 2 and verses 15 through 17 and, and see uh, how all of this is related here and, and the, the uh, genealogy and all of that. But uh, you'll notice that in verse 24 that Absalom passed over Jordan Uh, shortly after David did, and pitched his army in the land of Gilead. And uh, this is the same region where uh, David is going to be in, in Mahanim. But David had already made it uh, to the city, and he is replenished. And we see in verses 27 through 29 everything that he is resupplied with. Now, let's look at David's doings. We've seen Absalom's actions. Uh, How's David going to do? What is he going to do in all of this? Well, uh, I want you to notice in verse 27, 28, and 29, we've already read the verses, that he is given supplies by three men. And these three men are also pretty interesting Uh, Shobai, the son of Nahash the Ammonite. Let's stop here. Is he an Israelite? No. He's an Ammonite. But exactly who is this guy? Well, he's the son of Nahash the Ammonite. Now, we've seen this name before. We know who this guy is. You'll remember that Nahash was the king of the Ammonites. And after he had died, David and Nahash had a relationship, and David sent comforters to Ammon, to the family of Nahash uh, to, to, to help them during that time. But Nahash had a son by the name uh, of Hunan who got bad advice and was 
kind of had a character very similar to Absalom. He's a stupid dude. And he, the advice he got, you'll remember in chapter number 10, that David's not come here to comfort you. These guys are spies. And he's coming for you. And so, what did Hunan do? Well, of course, he mistreated them. And that sparked a war between uh, the Ammonites and Israel. Uh, and you'll see that in chapter number 10. Now, who's Shobai? Well, Shobai is Hunan's brother. And it seems to me he was the smarter of the two. And yet, Hunan's the one uh, that uh, went to the throne there in Ammon. Now we see Shobai, a few chapters later, helping David, resupplying David, having a relationship with David. Uh, like his father ha had had before that. So I find it interesting that Shobai makes an appearance here in the Word of God as an ally to David when his own brother uh, was an enemy to David. Uh, so we see uh, the replenishment coming from him. We also see a man by the, mes uh, by the name of Meshir. Uh, now, he's also someone we've seen prior. And I know we get to this part of David's life, we read over all of this thing, these things and just kind of, well, uh, you know, I don't know who he is, but uh, he's somebody that's given some supplies here. But wait a minute, we know some things about uh, Meshir. Uh, he is the man who cared for Mephibosheth after the death of Saul. And it was uh, in his house that David found Mephibosheth and brought him out of the house of Meshir and brought Mephibosheth to eat at the king's table. And now we see him loyal to David, replenishing David. And there's also a man by the name of Barzilla. And I'm going to wait on him because he's going to play a significant role uh, later on here. But uh, David comes over the Jordan River. And he is met by these three men. And these three men gave David some valuable things. Supplies and friendship. These are two things that are often overlooked. These are things that are often taken for granted, especially for a king. Uh, a king's never in want of food, is he? He's got all the food he wants. And as long as he's on the throne, he's got all the friends that he wants. But, David's in a low point in his life here. And we got three guys that have come and put themselves at risk and replenish him and befriend him, let him know, hey, we're for you. We love you. Is there anything that we can do to help you. Now, let me stop here and just kind of uh, get down to where we live. Because there are times when we're low. There are times in our lives, uh, even today, and even people here in our building, and, and even people that are watching uh, on the live stream right now, to where uh, you're at a bad point in your life, and you think everybody's against you, and you think that uh, there's nothing that's going to uh, help you, and, and there's nobody that can encourage you. And right about that time, uh, God will send some people to give you things that you never thought that you needed, and God will bring them at the appointed time, at the best time. And that's what David is getting right now. He's thinking, it's just me and my 600 guys, and uh, everybody else is against me. Uh, but guess what? Not everybody was against him. And he's going to find that out. And uh, these three men make an appearance uh, at the perfect time. 
And God uh, is going to use them in David's life. Do you know, uh, there are times when we think we ain't got a friend in the world. But then again, we find that we got friends that we forgot we had. And we got friends that will put their lives on the line to help us. And we've got friends that will come and help us in our time of need, even when it is not expedient for them to do that. Do you know what had been easy for these three men to do? Just to kind of sit back and see how all of this played out before they chose a side. But not these three guys. These three guys said, hey, listen, we know David. We know God. And we know what's right and we know what's wrong. And I don't care what the political winds, what direction they're blowing. No, sir. We need to go see David. We need to encourage David. We need to be a help to David. We need to resupply David. We need to lift David up. And so they encouraged him. You know, I, I said earlier uh, during the announcements that the beginning of this week brought with it a lot of different prayer requests. There's a lot of uh, time for my wife and I and some of you to where there's some uncertainty. There was some things we didn't know how it was going to turn out. Uh, we uh, got Miss Helen that uh, uh, tests positive uh, for COVID. And, uh, you know, we're concerned about her health. And, and there's other situations uh, that were uh, brought to our attention uh, this week that uh, we spent a lot of time praying about. And we, we had no idea how uh, any of this was going to turn out. Uh, but you know what? Uh, at the time of need, God says, don't worry, I got this. And God answered the prayer. And God answered the next prayer. And God answered the next prayer. You know about Monday, uh, we were kind of, uh, I don't know how this is going to go, Lord. Uh, uh, I'm trusting you. You got this. I know you, uh, you got this. And you know, uh, by the time Wednesday and Thursday and Friday came along, uh, God says, yeah, I got this. I got this. I got this. And which, with each phone call, with each text that came my way, I was reminded, oh yeah, God didn't forget about all of this. And right about the time that we needed it, God supplied it. Some of you were the objects of the prayer request or your family or your situation. And I know that you felt the same way when your prayer was answered, not really knowing about everybody else, but your particular situation, God met the need. God answered the prayer. And that burden was lifted off of you. And you were thinking, oh, thank you, God, you're still on the throne. I think David kind of felt that during this time. But, you know, it's just not supplies and friendship that... David found it Mahanim. Look at chapter 18 in verse number 1. And David numbered the people that were with him and set captains of thousands and captains of hundreds over them. He gets to Mahanim and he finds a lot of people that are for him. Remember when he left Jerusalem? He had 600 men with him. Now in chapter 18 in verse number 1, 
He's having to organize an army. Setting captains over thousands and captains uh, over hundreds. Uh, I mean, things are really looking up for him. Uh, all of these uh, men that uh, were loyal to David made their way to him. And as David is leaving the city and Shimei is throwing rocks at him and cursing him and, and all of the things that were going on, David was low. Had no idea how it was going to turn out. Because he knew that all of this was going about because of his sin. He deserved all of this. David never lost sight of that. And then he goes to the mount, worships God, gets across Jordan to Mahanim, and God says, you're not alone. You're not alone. You know, I brought up Elijah this morning. Remember, Elijah was discouraged. Why? Because he thought he was the only one that had not bowed his knees to Baal. And you know what God showed him? You ain't alone. In Israel, there are 7,000 knees that have not bowed to Baal. And David found that to be true in chapter 18. And now he is organizing an army. Now the precious time that was gained from Hushai uh, and the counsel that he had given Absalom is benefiting David in a great way. Now he is resupplied. He is. His army has been replenished. And now he's able to organize an army and a battle plan. And you know, this is not something, as far as the organization is concerned, that David is going to delegate. David's a very, very skilled general. David is a very skilled tactician. And he immediately organizes his men. He immediately organizes a plan. And the organization of his army is very significant here. Remember, previous to this, who had been the captain of the host? Joab. Joab has proven himself to be unspiritual and unreliable. David is now facing a very important battle. And he says, I am not putting my trust in Joab. And so David reorganizes the army and he reassumes the position of being captain of a host. Remember, that's the position he held in Saul's army. But he's going to divide the army into three parts. He's going to let Joab command one-third of the army. Uh, one uh, one-third uh, one will also be commanded by Abishai and another by Atei. And you'll remember him. He refused to leave David's side when he was fleeing Jerusalem. So David is organizing. David's ready to go. And he purposed to go into battle himself, but the people begged him not to. Look at verses, chapter 18, verses 2 through 4. And David sent forth a third part of the people under the hand of Joab and a third part under the hand of Abishai, the son of Zariah, Joab's brother, and a third part under the hand of Itai, the Gittite. And the king said unto the people, I will surely go forth with you myself also. But the people answered, Thou shalt not go forth. 
For if we flee away, they will not care for us, neither if half of us die will they care for us. But now thou art worth ten thousand of us. Therefore now it is better that thou succor us out of the city. And the king said unto them, What seemeth you best I will do? And the king stood by the gate side, and all the people came out by hundreds and by thousands. So David agrees to stay behind. But I noticed something he didn't do. He didn't turn to Joab. And he didn't say, Joab, you got it. He didn't do that. No, sir. He left it the way that he had organized it. And, uh, you know, um, uh, Joab is still going to find a way uh, to make an unspiritual decision. He's still going to find a way to uh, mess things up a little bit. We're going to see that later. But I want you also to see that David is not going to wait for Absalom to come to him. No, he's going to take the initiative and he's going to fight Absalom in a place of his choosing. And again, remember, David's a brilliant tactician. He knows what he's doing. And next week, we're going to look at the battle plan, and we're going to look at the battle. But there's one more thing to mention here, and that's found in verse number 5, and that is David's explicit instruction. And the king commanded Joab and Abishai and Atai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave all the captains charge concerning Absalom. Now this is going to be very significant going forward. Because what did David say to him? David said, don't. Don't kill him. Deal gently with him for my sake. We're going to see that Joab's still going to do what Joab's going to do. And uh, it is going to be devastating. But there's something else I'd like to highlight this evening, and we're, we're going to close with this. The characters that were mentioned tonight, they all had a significant role in the eventual outcome. But they didn't realize just what kind of a role that they played. They didn't realize that God was working three different situations at the same time to produce the outcome that he was always going to produce. Let me show you what I mean. The two spies, Jonathan and Ahimenez. Their big picture was, I've got to get a message to David. That was, that was the extent of their whole thing. Uh, they didn't have a big picture. They didn't know. Uh, it was hard enough for them to do what they're supposed to do. And uh, it took a lot of courage on their part. And yet they did that and they watched God work. But to them, they thought that was the important thing. No, 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 no. That's just part of it. God's working other things. With Absalom, I mean, God, God knew just what he needed to do in Absalom's life to get Absalom to do what he wanted him to do. By the way, that was probably the easiest thing because Absalom's so full of pride. And, you know, even though Ahithophel... Uh, that would have been good advice if Absalom was going to win. God used Hushai to thwart that plan so that the eventual outcome God wanted was going to happen. That was the easy part there. But everything surrounding Absalom right now, uh, Absalom's thinking, hey, uh, yeah, I'm going to win. I'm going to be king. I'm gonna, uh, everybody's going to be talking about me from here on out. 
And Absalom so full of pride, he didn't even realize that he was driving himself to his own destruction. And then there's David. David is juggling several emotions. David had no idea how all of this is going to turn out. Had no idea. He knew some things for certain. All of this was happening because of his sin. He knew that. He admitted that. He never let go of that. And instead of killing Shimei, what he, what he tell his men? He says, no, leave him alone. Because I got, I got myself into this. You know, this is happening because of me. And so David's got that in the, uh, right on the forefront of his mind. And uh, uh, he's got a lot of emotions going around. And he's got no idea how things are going to turn out. God could have killed him. And David would have, I, I mean, he's got it in his mind. You know, if I die, you know, I deserve it. So he's got all of this stuff going around in his head. And uh, uh, in spite of all of that, he determined... He was going to trust God through it. And he was going to let God worry about the outcome of it. And so while he is uh, juggling all of that around, he is kind of centered into my world and my situation and my circumstances. He is uh, trapped inside of what's going to happen to me next. He has no idea what's going to happen when he goes over the Jordan River. He wasn't planning on Shobai and Barzilla. Uh, he wasn't planning on that. He wasn't planning on hundreds and thousands of loyal soldiers. Uh, finding that he had no idea. He was just worried about his situation. But you know... While we have a micro view on everything, God's got a macro view. And God is just moving situations around, using faithful men, faithful women, and just moving it into place because he's got an outcome. And his will is going to be done. And we're going to see that next week. But the lesson for us to learn is God knows what He's doing. And a lot of times we get so hung up with our situation, we have no idea what God's doing over here and how He's going to move everything and make it all turn out well. I have the, and this is a very simple view. Uh, but it is a view that I have held uh, throughout my ministry, and especially the last 15, 20 years of our ministry. Um, I have looked at my life and my ministry as I'm just the man of God. And God has every right to do with me whatever he wants to do. He can, uh, he, he can move a situation in my life. He can move me if he wants to. And I got no room to complain. Do you know why? Because God's using me. And I have no idea what he's going to do, how he's going to do it. And that's none of my business. And I tell young preachers that all the time. That's none of my business. That's God's business. My business is being right where God wants me to be. And let Him do that. And, uh, I, you know, I, and I've, I've told you before, when God called me into evangelism, everybody just, I, I mean, they went nuts. And it was right about that time that I begin to use the analogy of a chessboard. See, God's got this view 
almost like a chessboard, and he moves pieces to his advantage for an outcome. And we don't have that view. I'm just a little pawn. And God moves a situation in my life, and all I'm responsible for is, God, what do you want me to do? God says, I want you to move one step forward. That's where I go. But where people get hung up a lot of times is, I don't want to be the pawn. I want to be the queen. Because the pawn gets to use one step at a time. Man, the queen can go all the way across the board. And the queen can knock out a lot of it. I want to be the queen. So, while God wants us to be the pawn and move to where his will is, we spend so much time fighting and arguing and debating with God that God decides to use another pawn or use something else. He does that with people. He does that with situations. We look at our situation and we're so consumed with our situation. We don't understand our situation. We don't understand why God wants us to do what God wants us to do. That's not our business. God says, okay, I'm doing this. I'm building you. I'm molding you. I'm making you. And uh, you're going to be used. But I'm doing that over here with Sister Gail, too. I'm doing that with Brother Glenn. I'm doing that with Miss Kashan. I'm doing that with Brother Phil. Uh, I'm doing that with uh, Miss Adele. I'm doing that with all of these people and uh, working situations. And uh, we don't... Adele doesn't know what God's doing with Glenn. And Glenn doesn't know... What God's doing with Kishon, and Kishon doesn't know what's going on with Glenn, or Gail. Uh, man, I called you Glenn. But, because we're all concerned about our own things. But you know what? God's got an outcome. God knows what he's doing. And God's just moving everybody in. And before you know it, that outcome's going to be done. That's what's happening here. We got spies. We got, a, we got a rebellious son. We got a king suffering because of his sin. We've got Barzilla, Shobai. We've got all of these people in their own little situations. God's just moving them. God's just moving them. And you know, God's moving them because he's got a plan. And he's got an outcome. And that's the lesson we probably need to learn tonight. We need to know what God's doing with me. He's got a purpose. I don't know what that purpose is. And, you know, God will reveal that to me when it's his time. But he's got a purpose. He's got an outcome. And God's outcome is always a good outcome. Amen. So that's our lesson for tonight. And before I forget, uh, where's Miss Juanita? Oh, she's in the nursery. Uh, your verse is verse number five. Uh, the king's instruction to Joab, Abishai, and Atai. That's your verse for your outline tonight. Let's pray. Father, we do love you. Thank you. Uh, for this lesson. Lord, I, uh, I know there was a lot of facts. I, I know that. And I know there's a lot of situations that we dealt with tonight. And, and uh, there's still more situations coming. But Lord, really I just wanted us to get to the place of understanding to where our situation is just one situation in a lot of situations and the sum of the parts 
is going to equal a, an outcome that you're going to orchestrate. Lord, it's just a privilege for us to be part of your plan. Lord, I pray that each one of us would find our place, not just in the message, but in your will. And Lord, may each of us be used as instruments to bring about your perfect will. Lord, I, I know that uh, it's been a, a, a trying year and maybe a trying few years for some. But Lord, you're bringing all this together because you've got a plan for Berean Independent Baptist Church. You are building us. You are molding us. You are preparing us to be able to uh, reach our community uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ like we've never been able to do before. And so, Lord, help us as we're being refined. Help us as we're being prepared to be mindful of your will. Be mindful that you've got a plan. Now, Lord, I pray that you'll bless our time tonight around your altar, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. All right, as Ms. Kasham begins to play hymn of invitation, I'm going to ask you to stand and let's spend the next few minutes with the Lord. I'm not in the habit of telling you how you should pray, but there may be some that maybe we just Lord I've spent so much energy trying to hinder what you want out of my life that Lord I I realize now that that wasn't right Lord, I'm sorry for that. Maybe we ought to be begging God, God, use me, use me, use me. And I think if we really want to be used of God, God will use us. <laughs> 